My name is Connie Kasser. I am the director of the Buddhist Studies Concentration here at Smith. And I have the pleasure today of introducing Andrew Olensky, who is our speaker. Um, Andy is a former senior scholar at the Barry Center for Buddhist Studies, as well as at the Mind and Life Institute. Um, he is um, he has a PhD from the University of Lancaster in England. He's an expert in early Buddhism and Pali languages and literature. Um, he has a, he's the author of a book called Unlimiting Mind, The Radically Experiential Psychology of Buddhism. And he has another book coming, coming out soon um, that's aptly titled Unlimiting Mind to <laughs> Um, and we also have the great fortune here at the five colleges of um, having Andy come and teach courses for us at, um, at Smith and Hampshire and Amherst. Occasionally. So um, we're happy to have him here. So welcome. Thank you very much, Connie. And, uh, Jamie, thank you for inviting me to come here this summer, and especially to all of you for coming. Uh, I really wasn't expecting a full house uh, in the middle of the summer. There's so many uh, excellent alternatives outside. I appreciate your spending the time uh, to come and share my examination of this subject. So uh, what I have in mind uh, today is to talk about three different things, or three different parts of the talk. The first is going to be fairly general and introductory, and probably uh, say things that many of you are already quite familiar with about the history of Buddhist art. Then I want to go into uh, more detailed and specific information about Buddhist uh, models of mind and consciousness, and how experience is constructed moment to moment, and what the implications of those uh, particular aspects of Buddhist thought are for artists, uh, people who are interested in making art. Um, and then finally, I want to demonstrate or illustrate uh, some of the principles of what I'm talking about by focusing on the work of a particular artist and uh, going over in some detail a body of work that, uh, that she's produced. OK? Uh, I'm not amplified. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Am I speaking loudly enough? OK. So I want to begin with um, a comment by a great uh, art historian of this region, Ananda Kumaraswamy. He was at the uh, Museum of Fine Arts in Boston for many years, an uh, authority on Indian art generally and Buddhist art in particular. And he makes a statement with which I don't disagree. Basically that early Buddhism wasn't particularly interested in the arts, or visual arts at least, in expressing their ideas uh, and even were somewhat antithetical towards uh, you know, the notion of uh, beauty and it provoking uh, desire and so forth. And um, so there isn't really any early Buddhist art to speak of. As he goes on to say, although I would disagree with one thing, namely that there is a high level of aesthetic appreciation in early Buddhist poetry. The Buddha himself appears to have been quite a fine poet. And so this is just a stanza taken from a, a poem attributed to Kasapa the Great, one of the primary uh, followers of the Buddha, in which he, in this area in Rajgir where he uh, dwelt, he uh, had this long poem on the beauties of nature and the beauties of the rock formations in the area. And this is just one of a dozen stanzas. But at the end of that poem, he has this phrase here. There's not so much enjoyment for me in the fivefold music as rightly seeing Dhamma with a well concentrated mind. In other words, even when they do uh, wax aesthetic in their poetry, they try to bring it back to not getting carried away by the delight of the senses, but uh, really this kind of more austere understanding of the way things are is uh, more uh, significant than the uh, distraction, shall we say, of aesthetic delight. Uh, Kumar, Kumar Swami goes on to talk about when we do finally see Buddhist art emerging uh, a few centuries after the lifetime of the Buddha, it's really just Indian art 
which is applied to Buddhist themes. These are two depictions, oops, wrong button. These are two depictions of the birth of the Buddha, his mother here uh, about to give birth to him. And there's nothing particularly Buddhist about it, uh, other than the theme being the birth of the Buddha. However, there's an interesting exception to this. Um, this image of the Buddha, as many of you know, was never depicted uh, for quite some time, but was only represented symbolically. Uh, in this case, we're seeing the, the tree in the middle on a throne, uh, sort of representing the Buddha sitting under the tree. So it, 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 there was something about this. The absence of the Buddha in the early centuries, it conveyed an idea that there was something ineffable about him. The reason they didn't just depict his physical body is because it wasn't important. What made the Buddha the Buddha, what was special about him in this tradition, was something invisible, something inexpressible, something internal and subtle and not to be depicted visually. Buddhism is all about inner states. It really has very little concern with the outer world, certainly in the earliest stages of its formulation. So the question for the artist then becomes, how do you depict in visual art something ineffable, ineffable as an inner state? Well, there are certain ways they did this, of course, um, in the classical Buddhist tradition. When the Buddha image finally did develop under Greek influence, uh, there were two features about it that sort of convey this idea of the ineffable. One is that the Buddha was seated in a yogic pose, and it's clear that he's engaging in meditation. So the very fact that what they're depicting is someone with the outward form that is evoking the sense that there are inner states, inner life, inner interests going on, that meditation is the investigation of inner experience. And this pose is very ancient in India. It probably goes back to the Indus Valley situ civilization where we find several intriguing old depictions of people sitting in similar poses. Uh, and of course, over time, other hand gestures developed to sort of uh, expand upon this notion of uh, the inner states, meditation, teaching, uh, fearlessness. The second uh, interesting feature about early Buddhist art that points us in an interesting direction is that he always seems to have a little bit of a smile on his face. What is this pointing to? What, what, are, what's, what are we being told by this? Uh, wherever the Buddha image traveled, this, uh, this ivory in China and uh, in Burma and in, in Thailand, it's a recurring image. The Buddha's got this bit of a smile on his face. What's going on there? What, what is it trying to tell us? Well, it suggests that, uh, th that he's got a penetrating wisdom into the nature of things. He understands reality in some way, some special way. And that puts this sm smile on his face, this sort of benevolent, uh, engagement with what's going on. Now, moving ahead to the contemporary world, of course, Buddhist art is alive and well, and there are many ways in which we are finding traditional Buddhist symbols reinterpreted in new media and in new uh, ways of looking at things. But it's also, it's, it's, it's still very traditional iconography. These are just some examples from some um, uh, Asian artists. Uh, this, many of you will recognize, was here in the Smith Museum uh, not too long ago, a year or two ago. Um, and the recent uh, exhibition at the Rubin Museum, uh, uh, Grains of Emptiness, it's trying to express Buddhist art in new and interesting and provocative and contemporary ways. But is there a distinction to be made between Buddhist art and contemplative art? I would suggest there is. How can an artist express the ineffable inner states Buddhism is pointing to in new ways, other than the gesture of meditation, the smile on the face? What are some of the ways that we might point to something um, that's an inner state? Well, traditionally Buddhism, of course, this is highly developed in Japanese aesthetics, Japanese art. And one of the ways to do that is for the artist to create a work of art that evokes a certain state, evokes the serenity, invokes the sense of peace, of, of deep understanding, of profound well-being that's manifest in an awakened uh, person. And you know, these, this genre of art, as many of you know, is meant to be a sort of um, 
uh, visualization. You know, uh, people in busy urban lives would unroll these in the garden and sort of imagine themselves sitting under that tree surrounded by the mist. And so it kind of evokes the, the serenity of the states of mind. We're also familiar, of course, with uh, much of the Tibetan iconography, especially Tonka paintings, which are a visual representation of inner landscapes, of inner states. And they would become the basis of these uh, the elaborate uh, visualization meditation practices uh, whereby one interiorizes these images in one's lived experience. And of course a classic example of this is the Zen garden where the whole idea is to create an environment where a person can sit and be infused by the peacefulness and the balance and the harmony and therefore participate as a viewer in the process of what the art is creating for us. Another way that we can look at contemplative art is that the artist is in a contemplative state of mind when the work is done. And this is sort of the iconic example of that. You sort of picture this Japanese uh, sage uh, sitting there for hours getting in just the right state of mind and then he picks up his brush and you know in one gesture makes this perfect circle and not perfect but imperfect and perfect at the same time and puts his brush down. And of course, this is a living tradition here. We say a very well-known Japanese calligrapher. Now, of course, the same sort of thing is happening artists worldwide. Uh, here's Picasso at work and um, uh, uh, Pollock and uh, others um, that are in a sort of contemplative state of mind when they work. Maybe an artist can't help on some extent to be into a contemplative state of mind as they do certain kinds of artwork anyway. Of course, it does raise the disturbing question. <laughs> this is the kind of painting I've done mostly. <laughs> and I've often got into fairly contemplative states of mind, um, painting the house, so to speak. Um, another way of looking at it is that the process of creating the work is itself a contemplative act. Um, we see this, for example, in the uh, sand paintings of the Tibetan tradition, where you can imagine the kind of concentration and focus and stillness of mind it takes for these young monks to uh, really execute uh, in a, such a disciplined way such a unique work of art over a long period of time. It's a meditation in itself just creating one of these. Uh, and here the, the object is not that important. It's the process of creating it that's important. That's another key then for how to understand contemplative arts. Uh, another art that I'm familiar with is uh, playing the shakuhachi. You know, it's, it's an expression of a meditative mind state. A whole sect of Buddhists in Japan developed a form of music, the Fuke sect, and playing shakuhachi music as a form of meditation. Um, and of course, y y you can then apply this to almost anything. You know, almost anything is a performance art. All performance arts are really have to do with getting into a contemplative state of mind, uh, whether one's cooking or uh, dancing in this Korean example. And so the thing is starting to get very broad and very uh, open. And we have to start, you know, asking ourselves, try to pull it back in. Well, but what do we mean by contemplative state? And what's a Buddhist contemplative state compared to something in another tradition? Or even secular uh, situations where the mind can get very still and focused and really have nothing to do with Buddhism, nothing to do with uh, the, the formal contemplations of the Buddhist tradition. So how might Buddhist contemplative art be distinguished from other forms? Well, traditionally, of course, one of the main things that the Buddha I emphasizes is wisdom. Maybe that hint of a smile on his face is not so much that he's in some calm, yogic, concentrated state of ineffable um, meditation, but maybe there's something he understands. There's some wisdom about the world. There's some intuition that he has about the way things are. So wisdom classically in Buddhism is uh, defined as understanding the three characteristics, the three marks, impermanence, suffering, and non-self. It often involves other things like interdependent origination and uh, you know, things like that. But this is traditionally the, the, the sort of three uh, marks, if you will, are characteristics of, uh, of wisdom that one understands through Buddhist thought and practice. 
Well, let's look at how these might be expressed artistically. In terms of impermanence, the classic example is, again, in Japanese aesthetics, this emphasis on the cherry blossom. This, the fact that the cherry blossom is so transient, it only blossoms for a couple of days, and it's so fragile, and that's what makes it beautiful. Its beauty is embedded in its transience, in its fragility. Uh, in, in the fact that it's uh, fundamentally a fleeting phenomenon. Um, going back to the sand painting, there is the, the practice of impermanence in that <coughs> as soon as these things are finished, or soon thereafter, after spending probably hundreds of hours constructing these things, they just wipe the sand away, and it's gone. It's not about the object of art. It's about the process of making it. And embedded in that is an understanding of the deep impermanence of everything. You're not trying to, in Buddhism, fight against that impermanence by finding something permanent. You're trying to adjust oneself to it and go with the flow of impermanence and so forth. Uh, one of the ways this is done in contemporary art, just one artist I know, Frederica Foster, draws water images, you know, waterfalls and water. You just look at this painting and you know that uh, half a second later it's going to be totally different. The medium itself is fundamentally changing. And of course, the famous uh, Andy Goldsworthy, who would regularly make these uh, astonishingly fragile constructions in nature, only to have them swept away in short order. In this case, I think he's working deliberately on an incoming tide that's going to uh, wash these sticks away. So there again, transience and permanence is sort of part of what the artist is working with fundamentally rather than something uh, just on the side. Well, what about suffering? Well, one of the things that modern art has gotten pretty good at, and it goes back, you know, some time, is getting beyond the notion of beauty. Art isn't just about creating visual pleasure. And you know, when we get into the Buddhist psychology, we'll see that pleasure arises, and then the, the question is what relationship you have to that pleasure. But art isn't just about beauty. And especially in the modern arts, you know, the, the sense of, uh, of art confronting reality, often a very ugly reality, a very disturbing reality. There are all kinds of uh, images out there that are deliberately provocative, deliberately ugly, trying to break us from the habit that art has to be pretty. It's uh, looking at pretty things. Um, of course, modern art uh, begins with, you know, a celebration of the ordinary. Uh, Marcel Duchamp's famous, uh, you know, latrine, and uh, I'm too polite to say in public what this uh, depicts, but uh, it goes along that same genre of depicting imagery that is non-beautiful, that's not, uh, that's, that's trying to challenge our notion of, you know, we have to feel pleasant in order to be okay. You know, Buddhism really is organized around suffering as a noble truth. There's an imperfection, a flaw, built into the fundamental fabric of reality. And wisdom has to do with understanding that and embracing it, rather than trying to avoid it or flee from it. But now the bigger question, of course, is non-self, this third of the characteristics of Buddhism. How in the world are we going to represent visually this notion of non-self? It's a perplexing idea. In ancient India, it was perplexing. It continues to be perplexing. You can't easily explain to someone, what do you mean non-self? You know, I thought I had a self. You're telling me I don't? Well, that's not exactly what they're saying. And of course, in ancient India, the Buddha was constantly approached by people who were asking him to explain it because they didn't understand it. So counterintuitive. Well, one of the ways of working with non-self is, of course, most Asian art was anonymous. But we can't really do that anymore. Um, and art is very much tied up with uh, personality and uh, who the artist is and their life story is uh, fundamental to how well they're valued, how well they're appreciated, uh, and of course how respected and honored they are by their society. The other uh, challenge the non-self has in art is that art making is an intentional act. You're, you're, you're deciding to do something. Where are you going to put the mark on the page and so forth? And you know, insofar as that intention is generated by a person or a self, um, then there's the paradox. How can an artist make a mark without making a mark? 
so to speak. How can you stay open to the non-conscious influences that have come up all the time in creative work while at the same time uh, working consciously? Mindfulness, remember, which is so important in so many fields these days, is really the practice of being conscious, of doing something on purpose, with awareness, <coughs> deliberately. Well, what's the paradox between mindfulness, more and more consciousness on the one hand, but less and less self at the same time, at least from the Buddhist perspective? So how can art be both about self and non-self at the same time? Well, here we need to switch gears to the second part, where we really need more information. We need to get some details from Buddhist psychology. And what I want to lay out for you is five central ideas of Buddhist thought based on their models of consciousness and mind and, and, and uh, experience that I think have some implications for artists and then to try to bring out what some of those implications are. The first facet of Buddhist psychology I'd like to uh, start with is this notion that experience unfolds as a series of discrete events. We all know that life is continuous, the mind is continuous, the self is continuous, the world is continuous, but it isn't. Uh, one of the things that one notices when one does a meditation is that you know, one can discern moments of knowing, moments of understanding, moments of seeing, moments of hearing. That in fact, below this threshold of, um, this is a, sort of the threshold of conscious awareness, there are all kinds of subroutines and uh, systems and so forth in the brain that are working at levels of scale that we can't ac access consciously. But conscious awareness, the stuff out of which our life, our lived experience, our phenomenological experience uh, resides, is at this level of macro construction. Every moment, a moment of consciousness congeals out of all some set of bits, if you were. Uh, and then it sort of arises. There's a moment of knowing, and then it passes away. And this happens again and again and again and again. The stream of consciousness is made up of a number of discrete moments. And this is a fundamental uh, insight of, of Buddhist uh, teaching. And it's a fundamental quality of Buddhist psychology. There's a lot of lore that goes in, in the Buddhist tradition, into analyzing these mind moments, looking very precisely, looking more and more precisely at what appears to be continuous and seeing how it's actually made of discrete elements. Now, what are the implications of this for the artist? Well, one implication is that each moment is unique and each moment is a new construction. That is, in principle, you can start anew every single moment. You can bring a freshness, you can bring a creativity, you can bring an, a, a, an eagerness to every moment. The obstacles to that, of course, are, are you know, our lethargy, our habits, our preconceptions, our predilections, and so forth. But to the extent that we're willing to work with lightening our attachment to those things, we have the potential to make every moment new. The other implication, of course, is that you have to let go of one moment in order to be fully open to the next. If these mind moments are, are hurtling by at great speed, we don't know what speed. I think that what's happening down here is very, very rapid. It's sort of the gammon range of, of, of mental activity, of 40, 50, 60, 70, up to 80 or 100 times a second. But this level of lived experience, where we start feeling conscious of having a thought, or seeing a sight, or having an idea, or remembering something, or uh, contributing to the element of problem solving, that happens much more slowly. It, because it's a synthesis of smaller uh, functions, that's probably happening more like three or four or five times a second. But it's fast enough that just like the famous example of a film strip, if it goes by fast enough, then you see it as a continuous whole because you're projecting a sense of continuity onto it. But because these things are going by very fast, if you're really going to be open to experiencing any given moment, you have to let go of any attachment you have to the previous moment. And in fact, meditation, contemplative practice, is at its heart an exercise in letting go. The minute you're aware of something, a sensation in the body, you have to let it go. 
in order to notice how it changes the next moment. The moment you've reached the top of the in-breath when you're meditating, you have to let go in order to open up to the out-breath. When you get fixated or stuck uh, or attached to something, then it's like the, the stream stops flowing and you go off on some chain of association and then you miss everything that's happening. So for artists, this ability to keep an open mind, to keep a light mind, to be without attachment as much as possible is an important ally. Uh, the second feature of Buddhist thought that I'd like to emphasize is that there are six different modes of consciousness. There are six different ways of knowing. Consciousness itself is just this sort of, we don't have words for it. It's knowing, it's awareness, it's consciousness. I'm using these words uh, uh, interchangeably. That there's some basic knowing, but that has to be channeled then into these uh, six different sense modalities. Neurologically, it's like the brain stem is sort of sending up consciousness that we're awake and not asleep and immediately hits the thalamus, which is like a switching board with these six channels, so we're aware of one or another thing at a time. Um, every mind moment consists of knowing an object by means of an organ. So what we have here is consciousness that can be either of the eye, the tongue, the mind, and so forth, and then each one of these opens up to a different kind of object. There's the knowing of the form with the eye, the tongue uh, tastes flavors, the body feels physical sensations, the mind thinks mental objects of various sorts. And according to this model, you can only know one thing at a time, and it cycles rapidly between the different modes, giving the sense of continuity. What are the implications of this for the artist? Well, first, Objects of experience are virtual, not real. There is no objective reality. And this is, of course, is one of the famous features of Buddhist thought, this sense of emptiness, of, of, of non-substantiality. It doesn't mean your experience isn't real. It's really happening, but it's not ontologically real. That is, it's not, there's nothing behind it. There's nothing substantial. These objects are not things out in the world, like the chair, the object is my impression of the chair, my visual uh, sight, and so forth. So that can be helpful to know, that you're really manipulating a virtual world of virtual objects at all times, not just when you're fantasizing. Every act is a creative act in that sense. The other uh, implication, of course, is that each sense modality has its own way of knowing. See, in our culture, this is much less so for artists. You understand this better than most people. But for many people in our culture, they're really trapped in this sort of tyranny of conceptual thought. We think the only way to use the mind is to think stuff, to have cognitive content, to be you know, doing something with uh, ideas and thoughts and, and, and manipulating them and so forth. But this knowing can also manifest on the other senses. When you, artists have a way of knowing what they see without necessarily thinking about it and learning to see without mediating it always through the mental, the door, the mind door, using the Buddhist terminology, is an important way of training the eye and training oneself to understand the world in a different way. And the same thing with, with the body, you know, dancers and athletes and, and there are people who have a body awareness that is not filtered through, not channeled through, not distracted by what we think about the body. It's immediate, it's intuitive, it's visceral. Uh, not all mind moments have to do with the mind, in other words. There's lots of ways that we can be fully conscious, fully awake, fully engaged with experience, and we're not putting it into words. We're not thinking about it. We're just being there. You know what I'm talking about, many of you here. Uh, learning to inhabit these non-conceptual ways of knowing is a, a great skill to develop, and it's something that artists in particular uh, tend to develop. So uh, just another visual for these six modes of awareness. So there's touching, and you know, the pointer here, consciousness is pointing at the body as the sense organ, so the physical sensations is, is what they uh, experience. And so we have this moment of contact between the mind knowing a sensation, what it feels like to touch something. Uh, and then there's a moment of smelling where we have an odor. 
And then you know, we can cycle through these six modes of knowing, and each one is different. This is going to, there's six mind moments in a row. Um, although, of course, in reality, they're going to be much more random than that. And we tend to be heavily in the, in the mind door and the body door, less so, of course, in some of the other senses and so forth. The third thing, uh, there are three different functions that contribute to shaping experience. So this is another picture of what I just showed you. This is a moment of consciousness that's arising from contact between a sense organ and a sense object. And there are going to be six of these, you know, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, and thinking. But now this model gets elaborated in Buddhist thought by some additional functions. Um, one of them is a feeling tone. Uh, there's this whole apparatus in the, in the body and brain for uh, synthesizing a sense of feeling. What does it feel like to have experience? And this provides, I, I'm calling it a kind of a texture to experience. The qualia, what it feels like to, to see red. Not just the data that it's red, but th that it has a certain experiential uh, depth to it, a certain sensory uh, richness to it. Um, and it's on the scale of pleasant and painful. This isn't feeling in the sense of emotion. This is just the hedonic valence of, do you like it? No, or, I mean, does it feel good or does it feel bad on some level? And so the object is known by consciousness, and then a feeling tone is wrapped up in it. Again, very close down at the base of the brain. The body sense um, binds with the moments of awareness. The second thing that, uh, that gets added is this sense of perception. Perception in the sense of providing structure to the texture. Uh, it, perception constructs meaning. It's, it's not, it, it brings interpretation. It's the co cognitive content of experience. If the feeling tone is asking the question, how does it feel? The perception is answering the question, what is it? What is it that I'm seeing right now? That's a chair, that's a table, that's a tree, that's an apple. We may or may not give it a linguistic label. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. But even if we don't have time to have a thought that that's an apple, we still at the sensory level, when we see that red circle, we intuitively and immediately know, interpret that to be an apple. And then the third part, which I'm calling emotion, is actually a, a, a broader sense than that, but it does provide a sense of mood. It's an intentional stance towards the object. It's our engagement. It's answering the question, what's to be done? What do we do about this object? What is our relationship to it? We are always engaged with our experience. We are participating. We are responding to it. And this sense of a quality of mind, whether it's you know, a loving response or a, an aversive response, those are emotions whether uh, it's um, you know, a strong response or a weak response, is a wide range. Um, all three of these aggregates, as they're called in Buddhism, are present in some combination in every moment. That it, the consciousness is colored, if you will. I'm using this metaphor because so many of you are artists. Consciousness is colored by these three primary colors, if you were, these three fundamental aspects of the brain, of consciousness, that, that, uh, of the mind, that shape and give texture and structure and meaning and mood to what it is that we're experiencing. And uh, you can't ha have you know, any of these absent. All three are always present. There's always a moment of consciousness, and there's always some object that that consciousness is, is aware of. Um, and so the implications for the artist here, and here I'm taking a little license with my uh, color theory, but the idea is that there are states of mind that are heavily colored by the feeling tones. They might be states of intense pleasure or pain. You might be immersed in raw sensory experience with little or no conceptual co content. Sometimes our experience is like that. It's very strong, very viscerally experiencing something. We're not thinking about what it is. We might not even like or dislike it or have any strong emotional response. It's just pure sensory feeling. The practice of this, or cultivation of this, or one expression of this in Buddhist practice is a samadhi, or concentration practice. 
the jhanas that one accesses, sort of states of absorption, are recognized by a, a state of profound pleasure that just permeates the body. I don't know what hormone is being released or, or, or whatever, but something is bathing the body in blith, bliss. And you might have very non-conceptual mind states, no images, no anamitta, no thoughts, no ideas, but a very strong feeling tone. Or, this is my attempt to have it mostly blue, but a little yellow and red, just like this was mostly yellow, but a little uh, red and blue. Um, emotionally volitional engagement can be strong, even when feeling neutral, without much of a storyline. Raw emotion, a little rationale. An example of a practice of this in Buddhism is the Brahma Viharas. When you practice metta or loving kindness, for example, or when you practice compassion for all beings, that emotion of compassion or of kindness becomes so strong, you're not necessarily focused on who is getting the kindness and who isn't. Matter of fact, part of the exercise, you go through everybody, so it winds up being radiated without distinction to everyone. And at the same time, it's not necessarily oops, a feeling of, uh, of pleasure or well-being, um, because one of the Brahma Viharas is equanimity, where you're not feeling a favor or a pose, but an even-mindedness. Uh, and of course, thirdly, we have a situation that's mostly red and very little blue and green. Some states are very conceptual, using language and symbols to convey meaning with little or no involvements of the emotion, even feeling tone. And there's some ways in which some of the insight practices of Vipassana have to do with using the intellectual capacity to understand the nature of things in a way that's not, that, that, that can be cultivated as, as a particular practice. Um, so for the artist, again, the implications, getting to know what mode your mind is working in and learning to change from one to the other is a valuable skill. All three are equally valuable and each brings their own perspective. It's not like, you know, ideas and thoughts are bad and emotions are good and, you know, anything like that. There are people that are more heavily uh, on the feeling side. Or some people organize their experience more emotionally and less uh, perceptually. Others are more in their head and analytical and rational. There are, of course, human types and so forth. But the point is that understanding that these three fundamental influences are at work in any given moment is a way to depersonalize what's happening. It's a way of exercising a non-self perspective, simply adjusting the color tone, if you will. And every moment is going to be unique color. The fourth uh, sort of feature of Buddhist psychology I'd like to share with you is that there are three interacting layers of conceptual interpretation. When we focus just on that perceptual piece, perception itself uh, is, forms very rapidly and automatically as a sense uh, that shapes and is shaped by prior learning. That's why I can't help but see the chair or the apple or whatever. They interpret the sense inputs into meaningful terms and, and how they form is not under conscious control. Perceptions are happening very, very rapidly in milliseconds. And so, you know, they merge into lived experience already well formed. Uh, but then these perceptions lead to thoughts. Thoughts uh, are more like organized around images or concepts, ideas, um, words. Uh, they unfold on the scale of lived experience. In other words, you know, we feel that they're of a size and shape that we can work with. We have this thought and then that thought. It can arise spontaneously, like when we're just daydreaming and having a, a stream of association, or it can arise um, very consciously as we're thinking through a problem. Thoughts are kind of the, the middle scale medium. Below the threshold, we can't control how the perceptions come into place, but the thoughts sometimes are under our control or influence sometimes not. And then, of course, what we think about a lot develops into a view or an opinion or a habit of mind or an, uh, an attitude and so forth. Views are built up gradually over time through learning and the repetition of thoughts. If you think something often enough, you tend to get a belief around that, that that's true, that's helpful, that's useful or whatever. These views are socially constructed and participate in a shared concept of meaning. I mean, our thoughts only make sense in the larger social situation. And once these learned, these views reside in the background in the unconscious. 
We learn something consciously, and as soon as we get it, we relegate it to the unconscious, so we don't have to you know, deal with it. And then it shapes perception. See, then there's a feedback loop where whatever views we've developed, they shape how we see things. And there's this sort of um, you know, top-down imposition of meaning onto all the sense data that comes up. Now, for the artist, several implications of this. First, understand how these three levels operate in your own experience of art making. You know, is this something that's happening very immediately and unconsciously and spontaneously and it's just sort of coming out? Is this something that you're thinking through? Or is there some way that you're trying to make a statement or, or tie into some larger uh, universe of meaning uh, and play a part in a larger narrative? Um, uh, one often switches rapidly from one to the other. All personal creations of meaning are going to be embedded in social constructs. That's important to know. Yes, you're unique and we all have very creative ideas, but we are very much shaped by the culture we live in, by the language we speak, by the people we meet, and so forth, and recognizing that is important. Um, perception can be distanced from the influence of view, like in a bottomed up, uncensored opening to unconscious content. Now, there, there are times when you want to let perception bubble up without the influence of views. You know, the view is what you expect to see, what you hope to see, and you project your wishes onto what's actually happening. Again, a lot of meditation is trying to get that, that, that critic, that sensor out of the way so that you can just, you know, be with what's happening. Or perception can be closer to views in, in, when you're trying to learn a skill, for example. And then finally, the fifth thing I'd like to point out about um, these sort of Buddhist models of mind is how the dynamics of the arising and passing away of a mind moment occurs. So picture, if you will, in this circle represents a moment of consciousness. And this moment of consciousness is sort of above the threshold of conscious awareness. Below this, it's unconscious. Above it, it's conscious. One has a sense and lived experience as a practitioner of a moment of consciousness arising and then passing away. That's the the, the phenomenological flow of the experience. Now, this follows the sort of the classic uh, definitions in psychology, the stimulus and the response, the input, the output, the sensory system coming in, the motor system coming out. That's what's happening every moment. Information is coming in, a decision is made on how to respond, and then there's some sort of motion is put into play with the body, either speech or mind or whatever. And then the thing happens again. Um, in Buddhist thought, they say that there's this sort of pool of latent dispositions or underlying tendency or personality traits, habits, all the ways our personality has been shaped through experience. And then in this moment's arising, the feeling uh, uh, coagulates and then the perception all on the sort of the upstroke or the in-breath or the, the, the front end of all of this. You can't control how you're going to perceive something or how it's going to feel in terms of, of it feeling good or bad when it arises. You're not, that's not under your conscious control. At the moment of consciousness, then on the downstroke, so to speak, or the back end of the breath of the mind moment is when the intention occurs. Intention is volition. This is where you make a decision. You participate. You make something happen. And the intention pushes an action, either a physical action or mental action, thinking a thought or a verbal action. And then those uh, intentions and actions have an effect, an echo, a sort of uh, manifestation in latent dispositions. So in this mind moment, you were a certain kind of person, you had this moment of experience, and you become a different person, slightly, incrementally different, based upon how you responded to that moment. Now, one of the ways they talk about this in Buddhism is that this is old karma or old causal influence shaping the moment. And then it's new karma or new causal influence that you create every moment. This is why what happens to you is not your fault. It's the product of your conditioning. But how you respond to it is something you have some influence on and it can help shape who you are in the, in the future and how the next moment is going to manifest. 
Now, so there's also another way to look at this is there's a passive aspect to this whole thing. This is the bottom-up causation where the perception and feeling are happening so rapidly you can't control it. Um, and if, you're not, if there's not a lot of conscious awareness, intentional awareness, then you're running on automatic. And many of our mind moments are like this, of course. You know, we, we rely upon habit and instinct and reflex to do what has to be done in any given moment. But then there's this other part of it, this active aspect, which is more of a top-down causation. You know, every intention may be caused, but it's also starting a new cause. It's a new beginning. It's a new world. And this aspect, this, uh, this active aspect, can be enhanced by conscious awareness. And of course, that's what meditation is trying to do. It's trying to bring enhancement to this area of conscious intention by doing things mindfully, by doing things intentionally, by doing things on purpose. So implications here for the artist? Well, one of them is, on the one hand, one has to allow feelings and perceptions to form naturally as the moment arises. arises. We call this staying open. Uh, not interfering, getting out of the way, uh, allowing things to unfold as they naturally will, as your deeper uh, you know, creativity is, is directing you. And the key to being able to do that is cultivating this attitude of non-clinging. I'm not going to attach to my prior conceptions, my beliefs, my assumptions. I'm going to try to stay as open as possible. Um, and then on the other hand, of course, we need to engage with what's happening intentionally as it passes through experience. You have to take action. You know, art, remember, as I said earlier, is an intentional act. If it's not intentional, then, you know, everything in nature can be viewed as art. But we call it art when a person decides to do something. Even if they just take nature and put it on a pedestal in a museum or take, it, uh, take a photograph of it from a certain angle, there's the intervention of this intentionality, this human intentionality. And so we have to take action. We can't be passive. We have to engage with what's happening. We have to alter it somehow. We have to bring something new, add some value, shift some perspective and so forth. The best way to do that is through cultivating non-clinging so that the action comes out of non-self instead of self. In other words, the action isn't you know, driven by certain habits or needs or uh, you know, e egocentric uh, ideas. So those are the five sort of key ideas from Buddhist psychology that I wanted to share with you. And then next I want to just sort of give an example of all of this in the work of one particular artist. And this is an ar ar artist who had a, um, uh, a show recently in East Hampton called Unfolding Terrain and uh, has uh, work over in the Janata Gallery uh, right now. And uh, I'm using her work because I know it the best, not least of why, because I'm married to her. <laughs> um, and I'm just going to draw from something she wrote that went along with this exhibit to help uh, exemplify some of these principles that I've been talking about. So this is really her work and her words, not mine. I'm just conveying them. So this is showing some sort of unconscious urge or impulse. Um, I'll give you in each case a few moments just to read it. I like this wording of sort of to embrace on the one hand and persuade, but also to allow them to reveal, you know, themselves. Um, so okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll pause a moment in each case. You see, this, the mind is flowing like a stream. 
And it's got various things there that we're trying to capture on the one hand and allow it to be on the other. And so the sense of trying to tease out from the flow of what's already happening, something that we consider meaningful, that we can alter in some way and bring some uh, structure and shape to. Uh, I will in just a moment. It'll show. So she talks about exploring water and color and came up with a new set of materials. I don't know how many other people work this way, but it's, it's uh, based on uh, sumi nagashi. So this is traditional uh, Japanese uh, art. Of, uh, sumi nagashi literally means floating ink. And this is actually a photo of like a tank of water uh, with the ink sort of, you know, dropped in, in droplets. And then what I've seen her do is, is sort of uh, spend a lot of time, uh, well, uh, I'll, I'll, that'll be explained more later, a lot of time with this uh, cauldron almost, you know, it's almost like scrying the future into this, uh, you know, this, this, mirror image and sometimes the inks and the chemicals will interact with one another in unusual ways and come up with unusual effects other times she might you know blow on the water or stir it in some way to sort of evoke certain movements and so forth um, this isn't just water there's all kinds of esoteric chemical involves you know th there's a lot of trial and error involved in it but this is where she talks about the non-self part that I, that I was impressed by. So painters are trained to make intentional marks. Um, but it's too much doing. You know, it's like I have to make a decision to be the person who decides this goes there or decides that goes there. So the question is, how do you get that part of the mind out of the way, and yet you're still engaging in some way with the act of creation. And this is the ink on a sort of, um, some sort of esoteric paper. I don't remember what kind, Japanese or Nepalese or something. This is a very Buddhist statement, working to create the conditions under which things will emerge. That, in my experience, is a lot of meditation is about. You can't sit down and, you know, become peaceful. You have to create the conditions. You've got to go to a quiet place. You've got to relax the body. You've got to get into a stable pose. You've got to let some of the day's stuff churn through the mind and let it all settle. Then you're creating the conditions where attentiveness will arise naturally, on its own, you're inviting it. And then the attentiveness, you have to cultivate that for a long period of time in order for the equanimity to arise over and on top of that. And so meditation is a series of this kinds of, um, not an act of will, you're not going to make insight happen, but you cultivate the conditions, which is a creative act in itself, under which the insights can arise, emerge. So she does start with formal sitting, and this goes back to our artists that use contemplative states as an element of their work to let the mind settle. And this too is a very Buddhist term, tranquil alertness. You know, the, the mind has to be, the first thing we run into when we meditate is restlessness. The mind is too busy. So you've got to relax it, get it settled down, get it more peaceful. But of course, if it gets too peaceful, it gets sleepy. It gets sluggish, it gets lazy. So you've got to perk it up. So you're kind of bouncing between restlessness and sluggishness until you find that sweet spot where the mind is tranquil and not restless, but it's alert and not lethargic. And many times in, in English, these two words would seem uh, to be opposites. But of course, in Buddhist experience, uh, they're not at all opposites. <coughs> I 
again, as I've seen her swirl these things around and, and you know, the paper, sometimes you just, you, you, then you put the paper on when it, everything is just right. You put the paper on just for an instant and you pull it off. And then there's the design, you know. And sometimes that's done only once. Sometimes it's done multiple times, multiple layers, multiple interactions. So again, I just use this as an example of, of sort of one of the many ways, there are probably hundreds, probably thousands of artists out there that are each in their own way trying to answer that question, address that paradox. How do I intentionally do and make something, but in a way that gets myself out of the way as much as possible? You know, in Chinese Taoism, this is Wu Wei, doing without doing. In Zen Buddhism, of course, it's an important aspect of the teaching. And you know, now it's up to us in the contemporary world, the contemporary minds, contemporary world, how do we find ways to do that sort of thing? To evoke from the medium that we're working with as artists something meaningful to us, but in a way that isn't limited by the narrower parts of our creativity, but is driven and open by the deeper parts. And then I'll end just with a quote from the Pali Canon, putting it all in perspective. <laughs> when a person produces anything, it is only form that one produces, only feeling that one produces, only perception that one produces, only volitional formations that one produces, only consciousness that one produces. These, of course, are the five aggregates. These are the five lobes of the diagrams that I had in there earlier. And it's a way of saying, it's not that that stuff doesn't exist and that it's not important. This only here is not to diminish it, meaning it doesn't matter. It very much matters because that's who we are. That's what we have. We have a consciousness of this moment. This is what we have to work with, our feelings, our emotions, our perceptions. But only in the sense that it's not something to get attached to. It's not something to get hooked by. It's not something to get oppressed by, to feel discouraged about. Life itself, the human condition, is something to engage with creatively, selflessly, and artistically. Thank you very much. Yes, any uh, comments or questions? Yes. Um, I have a question. Um, would you say there's something uh, in, in terms of this slide, uh, something that would be called pure perception and that may be formation is the place where the meaning part, the meaningful content could occur? I mean, I don't know if you would say that. Well, I, I, I shy away from words like pure, but I'd say that. Um, Perception is involved in every mind moment, whether we like it or not. I mean, it's, it's, it's part of the organizing structure of our mind. And so we, we, the mind can't help but look for patterns and see meaning in things. Maybe what you're referring to is, as I understand it, there, there, are, there are elements of styling that can be more or less conceptually understood or conceptually expressed, and that there's maybe uh, kinds of art, and maybe this is one of them, that's sort of m more um, feeling, tone, and emotion than conceptual content. I mean, of course, conceptual art is very much about the idea, and the object is often irrelevant. Um, but there are other forms of art. I'm thinking, for example, um, you know, a, a couple years ago in the Guggenheim, when the whole thing was lit up with these dramatic colors, and you know, you're just so immersed in the in the violet color or whatever, there's nothing to think about. You're, you're, it's a full sensory overload experience. So I think that with those three modes of feeling, perception, and emotional engagement, you know, one can go more, more strong in one or the other direction. Is, is that what you're pointing to?
other words, you, you begin to assess you being based on our perception, and it, and I probably put that more in information kind of things than the perception kind of things. That's all I'm going to ask. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I, I understand. Yeah, that goes back to the slide about the three sort of aspects of yeah. perception, that some of it is kind of spontaneous yeah. and intuitive, and then some of it is you is the recognition of some things being of value, some others, a kind of filtering, a kind of creative working with. That spot where meaning actually occurs. Where does meaning really occur? Where's that Yes. 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 It just feels right at some point, yeah. yeah. Yes. Well, I don't know what I said, right. but um, <laughs> I'll try again. Yeah. Well, you know, wh wh whatever medium we're using, whether it's, you know, floating ink or, you know, clay sculpture or words of poetry, there's a way in which we kind of, you know, try this out and try that out. We intervene in various ways. There's rough drafts. There's stuff that winds up in the trash. And then there's some, but there's some constant feedback loop where we're investigating it in terms of its quality, whether that's something, you know, intentional like symmetry or, you know, it's a perfect square or whatever, or it might be something far more uh, nebulous and intuitive. But there's a sense that when we see it, we know it. It feels right. Uh, and in each medium, it's going to be different. Um, and each moment, perhaps, each person, it's going to be different. But that, uh, I, I see that as a lot of what the whole process of art making is about. I think that's why you all do it, you know, you artists, because there's a way of finding that sweet spot. It's very rewarding when it does occur. Yes? Well, part of the answer is I'm not an art historian, so I don't talk on this often. But what I was trying to say about the Tibetan, the Tibetan art, I use them in, in, in three examples. One is that the specific symbology that they're creating, so precisely according to their tradition, is used as the foundation for a series of meditation practices and visualizations that are very specific to, to that, that culture. Um, uh, and that I would call Buddhist art, not necessarily contemplative art. The f fact that the sand painting requires so much attentiveness and uh, focused mind states, that I was calling the, the creation of the art as an act of meditative practice. Uh, and then the fact that, it's, you know, that there's fundamental non-attachment to the fruit of all that labor and they can sweep it away is an example of the uh, impermanence. But that's not the same as saying that, you know, those artists in Nepal are doing the same thing that what we're talking about here. Uh, maybe one more, then we should call it a day. Yeah.
I'm finding that the beautiful model that you've shown with the colors and how, um, and a lot of what you said is refractory too. Um, the model that I see being made now, um, you know, where you, you two try to um, sort of see how things mix and try to see if you can unmix them, and the answer is generally no, just as you can't unmix pain. Like literally, like there's a chaotic dimension to it that can't be undone. Um, our models keep sort of getting um, complex, certainly, but like complicated, like it's a verb, like it's hard to keep up. Um, if it's not uh, necessarily like the integer of one cent at a time that we can attend to, if it's like one cent three, or like 3.7, <laughs> you know, or maybe it's a range for people, um, does, does this survive? Does, will it continue to be useful? Yes, because this is the science of lived experience. And so the unit is always going to be one. Now you can measure that from a third person perspective. And what, it, what I experience as a single coherent mind moment might in uh, you know, some time a day measure you know, 300 milliseconds, you know, very rapid, because I'm driving a car or whatever. Another time, you know, it's late in the morning, I haven't had coffee yet, and it takes me you know, two and a half seconds to get a, a coherent thought together. So subjectively, it's always going to be one unit to me. But objectively, we're measuring it on a different scale. And that's the beauty of the field, is really the integration and interaction of first person and third person perspectives. They're not the same at all, but they're mapping similar territory. Well, thanks very much. I understand there's uh, food and snacks across the hall. Thank you.